All right. <clears throat> Looks like we're all here. Very good. All right. So welcome to the first night of derivatives. And so we'll be, of course, doing this online for the entire course. We have eight weeks. And um, so last night I sent out, besides the invitation, I also included the slides that we'll be looking at this uh, tonight. And uh, there's also an assignment. There's basically going to be an assignment every week which typically can be done in Excel, which is kind of nice because I think you may all have experience with Excel. And if you don't, this is a great opportunity to learn it. Um, in my opinion, Excel was one of the greatest business tools ever invented. And so the more you understand about it, the better off you'll be. Now, this is um, week one. And so let me go get our notes open for tonight. And uh, let's see, let's get that going. Now, I forgot to send you a copy of the syllabus. Um, I realized after the fact, I think that what happened was that the school asked me to make some changes to it, although they just got around to asking me about it yesterday or last night, whatever it was. So <clears throat> it isn't quite ready, but I'll send it out to you in the next couple of days. Also, they have this new thing called Brightspace, which apparently is a place where we can keep our notes and other information. I'm not that familiar with it just yet. So I'm going to learn how to use it so that, um, you know, apparently it's set up so that we can uh, load up all of the notes directly onto this website. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll just keep emailing it to you because um, it works just as well, I think. So um, we'll get into those later on. In other words, I'll, I'll finish up the syllabus and I'll uh, figure out how to get into Brightspace. But right now, the most important thing is we want to get into the material the very exciting material, I must say, because we're studying derivative securities. Now, you've probably heard a lot about these things, and they have kind of a bad reputation because they've led to many financial disasters in the last few decades. Although I must say, um, in every case, the people who were responsible were using derivatives in a very, let's just say, questionable way. Um, I mean, derivatives are a powerful tool, but they can be misused. And um, you know it's kind of like dynamite in a way. Uh, obviously, dynamite is a very powerful tool for building dams and bridges and that type of thing. But man, you've got to be careful with it. So derivatives have obtained a bit of a, um, let's say, shady reputation because um, so many uh, disasters have been uh, brought about as a result of misuse of derivatives. But they're very, very powerful hedging instruments. They can be used to reduce or eliminate risk in a lot of cases where, um, let's say, for example, if you're a US multinational corporation and you do a lot of business overseas, you're constantly being exposed to foreign exchange risk. Well, what do you do about it? Well, there's several options on the table, but uh, as we'll see as we go along, you can enter into a special type of derivative called a forward contract, where you basically are able to lock in the price at which you can buy or sell our currency in the future. And by doing that, you end up eliminating all of your foreign exchange risk at no cost to you, by the way. So, um, you know, that means that these forward contracts are very powerful. And so the volume of trading in them is absolutely astronomical. Um, and we'll discuss that as we go along. But um, the volume of trading in derivatives is absolutely insane um, because they're so powerful and useful. In fact, if you want to get a sense of... Um, just how much money is involved here. Why don't I do this? Um, let's go to the website of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, which is one of the country's leading derivatives exchanges. And they have a chart on the top, front of their website somewhere, which gives you a feel for how much volume of trading there is with these different derivative securities. So, oh, here it is, excellent. So here's FX. Now that means that the volume um, well, what they're saying here is the value underlying these contracts is $94.5 billion, and that's every single day. So what's essentially happening here is that forward contracts and futures contracts that um, are based on foreign exchange are traded every day, and the value of the currencies that are being hedged are almost $100 billion every single day. And if you think that's a lot of money, look at the interest rate uh, derivatives the daily notional value is $4 trillion. That's a lot of money, $4 trillion. Why? Because so many businesses, so many individuals 
find it necessary to hedge their interest rate risk. And so that's why the volume of trading is so massive. And then up here we have equity indexes, uh, roughly a trillion dollars a day, because this is represents Wall Street, um, you know, portfolio managers hedging the risks that their stock portfolios will lose value. And even agriculture, even at this point in time, agricultural derivatives uh, are being traded with a notional underlying them of about $41.6 billion every day. So there's a reason for these large numbers because these securities are so useful for hedging risk. But at the same time though, they can also be used for speculation. And we'll see many examples of that as we go along. And of course, speculation simply means you're, you're betting that a certain event will happen in the future, like let's say the dollar getting stronger, and this will enable you to take advantage of that by in a sense, placing a bet on that happening. So derivatives have a lot of different uses, but again, they, they've acquired a bit of a uh, iffy reputation. In fact, Warren Buffett, you probably know the very famous stock investor, once referred to derivatives as weapons Oh, sorry, financial weapons of mass destruction because of their potential to destroy financial institutions if they're not used well. So basically, why don't we look at this list and see what kind of derivatives are out there? The basic four types are known as forward contracts, futures contracts, swaps, and options. Now, some of these securities are, have been around for quite a few uh, decades, even centuries. <clears throat> and some of these are relatively new innovations. Typically what happens in the derivatives markets is that a derivative a security is created when there's a perceived need for it. So for certain types of situations, a swap, for example, might be your best bet. So swaps were created in the early 80s in response to the need for trading different exposures with different counterparties. And so we'll see how those work. Um, forward contracts have been around for hundreds of years. Uh, futures contracts are relatively recent. They were introduced sometime in the 19th century in the United States. And then options have been around for many centuries, but they've only recently been traded on a regular basis going back to about the 1970s. And in each case, when these were created, the idea was that Wall Street understood that there's many um, investors, there's many um, financial institutions, there's many investment banks that could use this type of um, hedging ability. And so these products were designed to meet that need and of course make profits for the Wall Street dealers. All right, so we're gonna focus on each one of these. Every week we'll be focusing on a different security. And um, now, by the way, there are others too, but many of those other types are much, much more complicated and they're often simply hybrids of what you're seeing here. So these are really the four basic structures that you can expect to see in the marketplace. All right, well, anyway, so um, what are we gonna do in this class? Well, number one, understand the key properties of the four basic types of derivatives. We wanna understand how they're different from each other and what they're meant to accomplish. Number two, we want to understand some basic hedging strategies. In other words, well, how in the world would you use one of these to reduce or eliminate your risk? Okay, so in other words, if I really am exposed to foreign exchange risk, how would I use a forward contract to eliminate it? So we wanna understand the properties of these securities. And at some point, we also wanna address the question of how are they priced in the marketplace? So um, these are all issues that we'll address as we go along. And so I, as I mentioned already, derivatives are primarily used for hedging risk, but also speculation. Now, the speculation part is where people have run into trouble in the past, as you can imagine, because unlike buying stocks, you know, when you buy stocks, of course, you're speculating. You're hoping that the stock price goes up. But there's a limit, realistically, to how much you can lose when you buy a stock. I mean, yeah, sure, you could lose the entire investment, but it's, it doesn't happen that often. With derivatives, if they're not used properly, you could actually end up losing more money than you started out with, in fact, quite a bit more money. And so that's why they're so dangerous. Even Wall Street professionals can lose a lot, a lot of money uh, and have done so with these derivatives. Um, in fact, uh, we'll mention some cases as we go along, but in the early 90s, See if I can find an article about this. 
There was a trader at Societe Generale in, in France. Uh, who managed, let's see if we can find this. Um, there it is. Um, Societe Generale loses $7 billion in trading fraud. Now, what happens sometimes is with these traders is they're not just losing money because they don't know what they're doing. Sometimes they actually create fictional uh, transactions to cover their tracks. And what can happen is they can end up making things worse that way. <clears throat> and so this Jerome character managed to lose, well, let's just say a lot of money. We're looking at 5 billion euros or about $7 billion from his trades because he was able to hide it from his bosses until the situation got completely out of control. And that's a lot of money. Even, I mean, Societe Generale is a large bank, but I mean, that's like a year's worth of profits that just went down the drain. And so this happens. It was from time to time <laughs> with these rogue traders. And um, because for whatever reason, they're able to hide what's going on. And, you know, a lot of them find themselves in a position where they keep trading because they hope they can get themselves out of the hole they've created. As long as they can keep it all quiet, they might actually be able to do that because they're in effect, they're gambling. Okay. And it's like, imagine yourself being in a casino and you've lost all your money. And then you go get some more money with your credit card and you say, all right, let me start all over again. And I'll bet even more because that way, when I finally win, I'll get the money back. But it doesn't usually work that way, does it? Absolutely not. So this is a classic example of a disaster that was brought about by derivatives. And often the problem is um, that this individual doesn't really know what he's doing. Okay. Um, so yeah, they were in a lot of trouble. And there have been other cases too, like they mentioned here, Nick Leeson. Um, he worked for a bank called Bearings, which no longer exists. And he managed to lose about a billion, a $1.4 billion of the bank's money in 1995 by betting in the wrong direction on Japanese markets. And the, the company no longer exists. It, it was sold to ING for one pound. <laughs> so the bank, Barings Bank had been around since at least the 18th century. And what's interesting about Barings Bank is that they were actually the bank that lent money to the United States in order to make the Louisiana purchase. So this is an old, old line bank. They've been around forever. And this one knucklehead managed to destroy the bank with his own very bad trades. Very bad trades. Um, <laughs> Again, but interestingly enough, Nick Leeson actually did jail time, which is very unusual for white collar crime. Um, he he just he actually did serve several years of, uh, in a German prison, and they only let him out because he had uh, some kind of cancer. So um, it happens, and so uh, throughout the course, we'll try to mention a few of these uh, disasters that have been caused by derivatives, just to show you what can go wrong. Of course. <clears throat> now, hedging itself is simply a technique for reducing the risk, uh, reducing or limiting the risk of a portfolio of assets. Okay, so there's a lot of ways you can hedge your risks. Just as a classic example of this, what about auto insurance? What is the purpose of auto insurance? Well, to make sure that if you have an accident, that your losses are covered. And so what you're doing there is you're hedging the risk that you'll have an accident. You're paying money for a premium or premiums for your policy. And in, in exchange, you're getting protection. And so that's what hedging is really all about. When it comes to derivatives, they are in effect insurance policies if they're used correctly, because they help make sure that no matter what risk you're exposed to, you can cover your risks with the proper use of derivatives. Of course, speculation means you're gambling. I mean, you know, let's be realistic. You're gambling, but you're basically trying to take a position in a financial asset to hopefully earn profits. Now, you might say to yourself, why not just buy stocks? Why do you need derivatives? The reason is because if you speculate with a derivative security, 
the, the potential rate of return is much higher than it would be if you own, let's say, a stock or a bond. And we'll discuss this with several examples as we go along. But the idea here is that derivatives are very heavily leveraged, which means that a small change in the value of an asset, like a stock, could lead to enormous profits for the trader but they could also lead to gigantic losses if something goes wrong. So they're very heavily leveraged in the sense that they're very risky, but um, it means small changes in the market can cause huge gains or losses to derivatives. Now, here's something that we're gonna to see too, when we, especially when we start looking at options. Options are extremely uh, flexible they give us a lot more opportunities for hedging than you might get with the other three types. <clears throat> they enable us to create strategies that are not possible with other types of instruments. So they give us a lot more flexibility, but at the same time though, they're also among the riskiest of all derivatives and they also can be very expensive. But yes, they're very, very powerful. You know, you can design your own hedging um, strategy with derivatives uh, in a way that's not really possible with the other three that we mentioned, forwards, futures, and swaps. So they, the options markets are by far the largest because uh, of their flexibility. Um, yeah, so they're highly leveraged, which means a small change in the value of an asset can lead to large gains or losses to the derivatives themselves. And this is how we find out, <clears throat> this is what happens to the Nick Leesons of the world. Um, you know, the thing is, Nick Leeson, he was betting on the Japanese stock market that it would go up. And at the same time that he was doing this, uh, Japan was hit by the Kobe earthquake. And so naturally, the stock market went down. So you figure Nick would say to himself, ooh, maybe I better unwind my positions and take my losses. No, he did not do that. He decided to borrow money and buy even more derivatives and keep betting that the Japanese stock market would eventually go back up. The problem with that is that what if it takes two years for the Japanese stock market to go back up? These derivatives are suffering losses in the meantime. And he did manage to lose more than a billion dollars. But the key to the whole thing there was that he was able to hide it because he was in Singapore and nobody was looking over his shoulder. The, the, uh, you know, the bosses back in London had no idea what he was doing because he kept sending them documents which showed that he was making money when, of course, he really wasn't. So the, 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 you know, the, um, the bank itself is partially at fault because they did not adequately supervise him. But uh, I guess they just never expected him to pull a stunt like this. And so that was the end of the bank. By the way, if this kind of thing interests you, there's actually a movie that was made about the Nick Leeson case. If you have Netflix, you can probably get it tonight or even YouTube. Um, let me write this in here for you. The movie is called Rogue Trader. Um, and if you've got nothing better to do one night, what's great about this movie is that unlike many movies that involve finance, they actually did a good job of explaining what was going on. And they did it in such a way that you kind of feel his pain. You know, you, you feel like you're sort of um, scared for him as you're watching this movie and you can see what's unfolding and how he keeps getting into more and more trouble and uh, is just unable to trade his way out of it. So, you know, if you've got a few minutes, you might want to check it out because uh, it really, his case had a lot in common with a lot of the other cases where derivatives traders managed to destroy an institution through their bad trades and their ability to hide them. Yeah, if, if they knew what he was doing, he would have been out of his ear very quickly, but he was able to keep it quiet. And so that's why the losses piled up so badly. Anyway, so, um, oh, here it is. Yeah, I mentioned it in the, in the slides. Bearings was bankrupted by the activities of Nick Leeson in their Singapore branch. And let's just say, even for an old line bank like um, Bearings, a billion dollars is a lot of money. And it didn't take long. It disappeared in just a few months. And, you know, they, they were at least 200 years old at the time. They did a lot of business with the Queen. And they were also issued bonds to help the United States finance the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. So, you, you, you know, the, this is a serious bank. Okay. And now they're gone. 
Um, so they set up, this is where they really went astray. They were doing just fine. And then they set up this trading operation in Singapore. And I don't remember why. Why did they pick Singapore? They must have decided that they needed a presence in Asia. And sadly, they picked Nick Leeson to run the branch. I guess he was willing to go. And they thought he was a good trader. But he was put in charge of the front and the back office. So the front office is where the trading happens. The back office is where all the accounting happens. And so if the same person is in charge of both, then there's always potential for fraud. And that's exactly what happened. Yes, he was betting on the Nikkei 225. He was betting that the stock market would go up. But because he was wrong, uh, his losses increased very, very quickly. And so he was able to continue hiding this by sending fraudulent statements. Actually, this is why he went to jail. Not the trading losses, but the fraudulent bank statements that he sent back and forth, because that meant he wasn't just a bad trader, he was also a crook. Okay, he was covering his tracks and breaking the law every time he did that. And so that's really why he ended up in jail. Now, ironically enough, what do you suppose he ended up doing when he got out? He ended up becoming a lecturer that goes to banks and helps them spot rogue traders. Okay, so that's what ended up happening. All right. Um, so yes, okay, and I mentioned this uh, rogue trader is the name of the movie and um, he actually did spend time in a German prison. All right, so we're gonna start at the beginning now by explaining exactly what a derivative security is. It is a financial asset whose value is derived, and that's where the name comes from, by the way, derivative derived from an underlying security, such as a stock or a bond. Now, at this point in time, derivatives are potentially available on almost any asset you could conceivably imagine, everything. Um, it's not just stocks and bonds, it can be the price of a commodity like gold or oil. It can be, um, interest rates, it can be stock indexes like the Standard & Poor's 500. And it can be in things that are not financial at all. In fact, it's possible to buy derivatives where the underlying asset, so to speak, is the temperature or the snowfall. They do exist. Yes, they do. You can actually buy a derivative which provides you with a payoff if the temperature is too high or too low, or if there's too much snow, if there's not enough snow. Now, of course, these are very unusual, but they do exist. And you can go out there and negotiate one with a, an investment bank. But the ones you see trading the most often, like we saw in the CME here, um, these are the you know standard ones like metals, precious metals like gold, silver, platinum, palladium, the industrial metals like copper and zinc, um, interest rates, foreign exchange, equity indices, energy, and then of course, agriculture, these are the oldest of the group, of course. Um, you know, agriculture futures have been around since at least the 19th century in the United States. Um, some of these others are quite a bit newer. And so you can see if you want one of these products, this is one place you can get them. The Chicago Mercantile Exchange, which is obviously in Chicago, but I mean, it's right smack in the middle of their financial district, which is quite large and impressive. You think New York would have all the derivatives exchanges, but no, because they, they got to the game very late. Uh, Chicago is the primary source of derivatives trading in the US. All right, well, anyway, um, so some derivatives are bought directly through organized exchanges like the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. It's, a, it's an exchange where they trade derivatives instead of stocks. And they have all the kinds of rules and the regulations. And um, there are a lot of benefits to doing it this way. But flexibility is not one of them. If you want to buy a derivative through the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, you basically have to take whatever they have. You, you have no real control over the securities that you can buy. Whereas if you go through the so-called over-the-counter market, then you are negotiating it directly between with you and what's called a counterparty. So let's say that I need to hedge my risk in a very obscure currency, like let's say the Malaysian ringgit. 
And there aren't any, you're not going to find that here in Chicago. And this, no, the, these foreign exchange contracts will be restricted to the major currency pairs like the pound and the Swiss franc and the, you know, the euro. In fact, they may have a list here. Here we go. They have euro, yen, pound, Australian dollar, Mexican peso. This is, these are the emerging markets, of course. Brazil, uh, Russia, and South Africa, but not, not Malaysia, okay? It's not here. There's not enough trading volume to justify it, okay? So what if I need to hedge my risk in Malaysian ringgits? I can call up, let's say, Goldman Sachs and say, listen, Goldman Sachs, I want to buy a derivative that hedges my risk with the uh, Malaysian ringgit. And they'll say, sure, no problem. And they will tell you what it would cost and they'll set it up for you. And all of a sudden you have a derivative security between you and Goldman Sachs. And what that means is I have the right to either buy or sell ringgits from Goldman Sachs at a specified price. There goes my risk. I don't have to worry about it. Goldman Sachs now is responsible for that risk of the Malaysian ringgit. So that's what we call an overly counter market where we have trading directly between what we call counterparties, okay? So in other words, the two parties to the contract are called counterparties. So we negotiate directly with those and this way you can have whatever you want. You go to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, you're only gonna get what they have, that's it, all right? You don't see what you want, you're not gonna get it. All right, um, now here's some other exchanges where you can buy derivatives. The Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the New York Mercantile Exchange, I think they only have energy derivatives, but I'm not positive. I had to look that one up. And then the London International Financial Futures Exchange. It's kind of like the equivalent of the CME in London. It's enormous. And they do a lot of tr derivatives trading throughout Europe. So if you're a German bank uh, and you need derivatives, you might go directly to the London International Financial Futures Exchange because they have what you want. Although they might have some in Germany too, um, we'd have to check that out. And then the ones that are negotiated directly between the counterparties are trading in what we will call the over-the-counter market. Bec I suppose because you, when you're trading, you're standing on the opposite sides of a counter. I, you know, we'd have to check out the actual origins of this name. But over-the-counter means no exchanges are involved. It's directly between counterparties. So. Um, those, you know, again, the advantage of doing uh, over the exchange, uh, so oh, sorry, over the counter is the flexibility. The disadvantage, though, is that there's credit risk when you deal with a single counterparty. So if I go to Goldman Sachs and say, listen, I want to buy Malaysian ringgits in six months, they, they'll say, fine. What if Goldman Sachs goes out of business in six months? Then we have a problem. The exchanges are not going to go out of business. They guarantee their performance of all of their contracts. So therefore, you, you're perfectly safe buying through an exchange, but again, they may not have what you need. All right, so why don't we now take a closer look at these four basic types of derivatives, which we've mentioned many times already, and let's see what makes them tick. Now, this is just an overview, by the way. We'll be taking a much closer look at each type of security during the rest of the course, okay? I don't remember the exact breakdown. In fact, I'll tell you what, let me do this for you. Um, I did say that the syllabus isn't quite ready yet, but I can show you last year's derivative. I'm uh, sorry, last year's, last year's syllabus. Just to give you a feel for what you need to know. Now, first things first, there is a textbook for this class. It's available, it's easy to get this on Amazon. In fact, let me just get you over there. Uh, where is it? Here it is. Oh, is that the newest version? It seems a little hard to believe that they haven't updated it in four years, but this, I'll tell you what, this is the classic textbook in this market. 
Options, Futures, and Other Derivatives by John Hull. He is he was the first to come out with an actual textbook for derivatives like this. And he he must have, he's probably sold a ton of copies of this book. It is, I mean, the idea that a hardcover like this could go through 11 editions is pretty surprising. Everybody in Wall Street has a copy of this book somewhere in their office. This is the big textbook in the derivatives markets. The book is very long. You should own this book if you're interested in this field. But keep in mind, <laughs> there must be at least 30 chapters in this book, 37. And we're only going to have time to do maybe 10 of them. The rest of them, you know, you can read up on them. They're much more specialized, but uh, we're going to focus on his discussion about what are options, forwards, futures, and swaps. We won't get too deeply involved with the pricing models because they're very mathematical. We're more interested in focusing on the futures of these uh, securities and hedging and trading strategies, which, as I mentioned before, we can typically do in Excel, which is very helpful. But if you're interested and you want to learn more about these different topics, um, this is a great place to start. Because he's, he's this, like I said, this is the gold standard for all derivatives textbooks. It's not that there aren't any others. It's just that, um, let's just say, this is, this is the guy you want to go to. So that's the book that I'm using with my slides. In other words, the slides are based on Hull's book. Excel is listed here. I'm sure you all have a copy of Excel. And I'm hoping that you already have some familiarity with it. You don't, you don't really need too much background in Excel to do what we're going to do. We're going to use formulas. We're going to draw graphs, uh, you know, things like that. It won't be terribly, terribly advanced. Uh, Excel, I mean. We're not going to do anything very, you know, very advanced in Excel. Uh, but the Excel lets us organize our data well and provides, in a lot of cases, we're going to analyze these derivatives with graphs. It's very helpful to understand their properties. And then we're going to go through and we're going to learn a lot of good stuff. Where is it? Here we go. We're going to look at futures markets, uh, forwards and futures, swaps, options. Several weeks we'll spend on options. These chapters here are really more about pricing options, which the formulas you, when you see them, they'll look very scary, but in reality, they can be fairly easily implemented in Excel. And they'll give us a lot of insights into how options operate and um, what gives them their value. And then we're gonna learn about more complex options, options on futures. And then finally, the Greek letters means we're gonna be analyzing the risks of, of uh, uh, sorry, uh, options. Okay, so we're gonna cover a lot of very interesting topics along the way and all the assignments in principle can be done in Excel. So for example, why don't we go back and take a peek at the assignment for this week before we get too deeply involved here. Okay, let's see. All right, so you're gonna be asked to do some calculations with a forward contract and a swap and talk about the differences between forward and futures contracts. So no problem, we'll be getting through all of this tonight. And even though there's some math involved, it's not very complicated. Uh, what's really important is the structure of the derivatives themselves. Okay, that's what we're after. All right, so now that's that. So like I said, I will give you the updated version of this as soon as I can. They sent me a list of new changes they wanted me to make and I haven't had a chance to do it because I mean, they really just literally sent this to me like this morning. So, but at least now, you know, um, if you want to make a note of this book, if you want to get it right away, um, let me just leave it there for a minute so you can make a uh, copy of that down. So uh, the Hull's book, like I said, is very, very good. Uh, it is really one of the classics in this field. And it's very readable too. I mean, it's a very complex topic, but he still manages to bring it down to earth pretty well. Now, it may be up to the, this one says the 10th edition. I'm not sure where it is. 
he used to update this book like every two years. Now I've noticed he's sort of slacking off a bit. It makes me wonder if he's retired or something. Um, but yeah, in the, <laughs> God only knows he could live off the money he's made just from this book. All right, well, anyway, um, let's get back to the notes. So we we'll start, and again, we have the four basic types. We'll start with the forward contracts. Now, I alluded to this earlier. What is a forward contract? It's an agreement. It's literally just an agreement. It's a legally binding agreement between two counterparties in which one of them will buy an asset in the future and the other will sell. This will take place at a specific date in the future. And the most important detail is that the price will be settled on today. That's what means makes it such a good hedging tool. Because what you're basically doing is saying, I want to lock in the price at which I can buy or sell something in the future. And it could be anything. It could be literally anything. Gold, interest rates, um, you know, and even non-financial items like I mentioned earlier. But typically, these are used in many cases for foreign currencies. And in fact, I have an example of that right here. Now, this example obviously is a little dated because you know at this point in time, the exchange rate between the dollar and the pound is quite a bit lower. This was pre-Brexit. Um, let's see, what is it now? At this point, I'm gonna guess it's around a dollar forty. Um, yeah, a dollar thirty-six. Okay, roughly a dollar thirty-six. So each British pound will cost you one point three six six one. So if you're going to go on a trip to London, this is how much you expect to pay for your pounds. All right, but let's just say that in this example, this is the, now this is referred to as the spot price or spot exchange rate. So um, what does that mean? Well, these are spot exchange rates, which means that you are being offered the opportunity to buy them right now. If I want British pounds immediately, I can go up to a dealer and say, listen, I need 100 pounds. And they'll say, fine, you can have as many as you want for 1.3661, $1.3661, and here they are. But what if you don't want to take immediate delivery? Suppose, for example, I know that in three months, I will need to buy British pounds because I've entered into a contract. I, I, let's say I borrowed pounds somewhere along the way, and I need to make a payment on that loan in three months. And I know exactly how many pounds I need, but I won't need them for three months. Well, I could wait three months and buy the pounds at that time, but what if the price goes up? That's gonna end up costing me a lot more money. So what I can do instead is approach a counterparty, say, listen, I need to buy British pounds in the future. In this example, it's six months. And the counterparty says, sure, no problem. You will, I will enter into this contract with you where you have the right to buy the pounds in six months at an exchange rate of 167.15. So this rate is only available if I'm willing to wait six months to take delivery of my pounds. The spot exchange rate is the first quote. This is the price I'll pay if I need them right away. Now you're probably wondering, if the forward, and by the way, this is called the forward exchange rate. Specifically, it's called the six month forward exchange rate. The word forward is meant to indicate that this transaction will take place in the future. Specifically, six months in the future. All right, the spot exchange rate doesn't have a time associated with it because you're buying the currency right now. So yes, so the question becomes, and we'll see where, What's driving this? Why is it cheaper to buy the forward pounds instead of the spot pounds? That's a very good question. It turns out 
that the relationship between the spot exchange rate and the forward exchange rate depends on how much time elapses between now and the time the, con the um, pounds are delivered. And also it depends on the interest rates in the two countries. And in fact, we're gonna see a formula very soon that ties these together and lets us determine exactly what the six month forward exchange rate is based on the current spot exchange rate, the time and the interest rates in the two countries. All right. Now here's a side note. The foreign exchange market is what we call a dealer market. You can buy or sell currencies from any dealer at a moment's notice. They're always ready to buy or sell. But when you, let's say, I don't know if any of you have ever been to um, a foreign country where you needed to exchange dollars for foreign currency. If you look at the quotes on their board, for every currency, you'll notice there are actually two prices. What's going on with that? Why are there two prices? The first one is called the bid price. The second one is called the ask price. So you have to think about this from the perspective of a profit making dealer. If you wanna buy the pounds, you have to pay the higher price, the ask price. If you wanna sell your pounds, you're gonna receive the lower price, the bid price you're gonna lose on every transaction. What you're losing though, is the profit of the dealer. Without that, there'd be no dealers and we couldn't get our currencies when we need them. So they're doing this, they're providing us with a service and in exchange for that, this is how they make their money. Every time somebody brings them pounds, they pay $1.32. Every time somebody wants to buy pounds, they charge $1.42. And this goes on all day long. And so by the time the day's over, the dealer has made some nice money. So the reason why I'm bringing that up is when you don't see that here, it's assumed when you see these quotes that this is actually the midpoint of the bid and the ask prices. So in other words, it might be that the bid price is $1.32 and the ask price is $1.40. So the one you'll actually pay depends on whether you're buying or selling. The quote here is simply the halfway point between the two. And so it's understood that that's what these numbers mean. Like it says here, the data is not based on any actual market trades. That's why. Oh, look at that, the ring it is in the news. How hilarious is that? I just randomly chose the ring it for my example. The Malaysian ring is looking surprisingly calm. Um, Malaysia's economy rebounds amid an easing of virus-related curves. So I guess they're uh, reducing the restrictions because of the COVID. And so they expect their economy to bounce back. How do you link that? Because obviously a lot of their money comes from tourism. And so the COVID is the worst thing that could have ever happened to them. But anyway, yes, so now you know, when you see these, you'll know that these are actually the midpoints of bid ask uh, prices. And the spread, the difference between the two is called the bid ask spread. This is the source of the dealer's profits. So anyways, I was gonna say, if you ever went to, um, uh, let's say you're in an airport and you go to buy British pounds, you, you will look and see that there's two numbers and you might say, well, why are there two numbers? This is why, okay. One is the price you'll pay to buy. The other is the price you'll get paid to sell. Now for very small transactions, these can be very, very different. In fact, the last time I was in France, I bought a bunch of euros and I didn't need them. And when I came back, um, I paid like $1.28 for each euro. And when I got back, there's a um, foreign exchange dealer on the corner of 42nd and... Um, I guess that's Lexington, I think. I have to think about it. I haven't been in the city in a while. And they offered me 98 cents for each of my euros. So for me, the bid ask spread was 98 cents up to $1.28. And so I got kind of burned on that one. 
So I wasn't happy, but it was only about 80 euros, so it hardly mattered. But um, I was a little surprised by how big the spread was. I mean, I really, I was expecting to get at least a dollar for each of my euros, but no, it had to be 98 cents. Okay. So anyway, um, if you're using, if it's a big transaction, let's say you're General Motors and you need a million pounds, not a hundred pounds, the spread would be tiny. You notice how it's less than a penny. Well, the dealer can afford to give you a sweet deal on this because um, for a million dollars, this is 0.02, this is less than a penny. And yet, if you multiply a million dollars by this number, it's still $2,000. So imagine yourself making $2,000 on a single trade. That's not too bad. Okay. All right, now. All right, we know that. Forward contracts are not traded through exchanges. They're traded through the over-the-counter market only. All right, so if you want a forward contract, don't go to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange because they don't have it. You must go to an investment bank. Uh, or it, no, there could be other types of dealers that have them, but you're not going to get this through an exchange. And again, the advantage of this is that you can choose any features that you like, as long as you're willing to pay for them. <clears throat> so if you need, let's say, a not very commonly traded currency, or if you need to take delivery in a strange length of time, like 40 days or uh, you know something along those lines, this is the way to go. You get the maximum flexibility. Not only that, but there's no cost associated with this. In other words, it's an agreement. If I go to Goldman Sachs and say, listen, I need to buy 100,000 British pounds in six months, uh, I mean, it's possible that they'll charge me a fee of some kind, but the contract itself is free because it's just an agreement. That's all it is, an agreement. So uh, especially if I'm one of their best customers, like, like if I'm a big customer, they might do this for free or as part of the uh, services that they offer me. Let's say I'm a high net worth individual. One of the things they're willing to do for me is trade derivatives with me uh, at no expense. Now, um, sometimes you might need to buy through a forward contract and sometimes you might need to sell. So in, in Wall Street, the terminology that we use here is when you're buying something, you're, you're taking on what's called a long position. So if I enter into one of these contracts in which I agree to buy British pounds, that means I have a long forward position. The counterparty to my contract though, is that they're required now to sell pounds to me if I want them to, and they're said to have a short position. All right, so this is the way it works. Buying or being in a position to buy means you have a long position. Being in a position to sell means you have a short position. Okay, so when you see those words long and short, you know what it means. Long means you're buying, short means you're selling. And for every long position, of course, there has to be a short position. All right, now, how does one hedge foreign exchange risk with forward contracts? All right, let's find out. So imagine, okay, here's a different example. Oh, there's, this is a quick little side note, just in case, um, if you've forgotten how this works, if we currently have an exchange rate of $1.30 per pound, and that rises to $1.35 per pound, which currency became stronger and which became weaker? Now, it turns out that this Zoom system has the ability to generate polls or quizzes, I guess. So let's see what I can do. Um, which currency In this case, I appreciate it. So we have the dollar and we have the pound. All 
obviously that's the only two choices we have. So what we're gonna do now, just for the fun of it, is we're gonna take this survey or poll or quiz, whatever you wanna call it. And I'm gonna, now remember what happened. The exchange rate went from $1.30 to $1.35 per pound. All right, now also I just wanted to point out to you that the word appreciation means it gets stronger. So we want to know which currency just got stronger. All right, let's see how this works. I want to see if this actually does what it's supposed to do. So let's see what you can come up with. Which currency just got stronger? Okay, only one person. Ah, uh, two people, three, four. Ooh, we have people who are embarrassed to say, I guess. All right, well, at least we can see the thing works. So we'll stop it right there. And the correct answer is the pound. But the question is why? Why is the pound stronger? Well, think about it this way. The dollar is weaker because it now takes more dollars to buy a pound. That means the pound is stronger. So it's the pound that is appreciated while the dollar has depreciated, okay? So one currency always has to depreciate and the other has to appreciate. So, okay, now, what that was a, the reason why I brought that up is because this way it'll make more sense when we see how we're gonna hedge our risk. So imagine yourself in this position. You're a U.S. importer. You, you're on the, in the habit of buying British goods and selling them in the United States. Suppose you're the country's leading importer of sticky toffee pudding, and you sell it in American stores. Okay, remind everyone, this is a classic British treat, sticky toffee pudding, and people buy it in American stores. But in order to buy the sticky toffee pudding, as an American importer, you must pay pounds to the British exporter, okay? The manufacturer of the sticky toffee pudding is going to expect to be paid in pounds. I've already placed an order. I know that in six months, I'm going to need to deliver 100,000 pounds to the uh, British company. Now, again, here's the problem. What happens if the exchange rate goes up? Um, let's see, I have an example right here. If the exchange rate goes up, as we saw a minute ago, from 130 to 135 a pound, the cost of me buying 100,000 pounds goes up by $5,000. Ouch. I don't want that to happen. That's going to eat into my profits. Now, of course, there's always a possibility that the opposite could happen. What if it drops? by five cents a pound. I'm going to save $5,000. Now, of course, the problem here is that we don't know what's going to happen. And as a business, we may not want to simply wait and hope for the best. That would be very risky. So instead, we decide, let's enter into a forward contract to hedge our risk. We want to lock in the price that we pay for the pounds and that way, no matter what happens in the next six months, we know how much it's going to cost us to buy the pounds. Okay, so we're going to enter into the contract because again, our job is not to speculate on the, on the currencies. We're trying to make money from sticky toffee pudding. So we are going to enter into a forward contract to buy 100,000 pounds in six months. What if the quote that's given to us is $1.32 a pound? That means that we're locking in a price of $132,000 for the pounds in six months. If the exchange rate goes up, we'll be very happy that we did this. If the exchange rate goes down, we'll know that we could have saved money by waiting, but we'll also recognize that we at least eliminated all of our foreign exchange risk. So the idea here is that we're the buyers of the pounds, so we enter into a forward contract to buy pounds through the contract instead of waiting six months and buying them in the marketplace. 
and you can see how powerful and flexible this is. Since this is a forward contract, I can buy or sell any amount that I want, and it could be any time. It doesn't have to be an even amount like six months. It could be 38 days, for example, or it could be 94,000 pounds. So anything I need, I can get it through a forward contract. Now, what if I'm not an importer? Oh, no, this is different. This is a different example with the same importer. If I lock in a price, let's say the exchange rate now is $1.70, the forward exchange rate. I'm guaranteeing myself the ability to buy the pounds for $170,000 in six months. But I've got this little diagram here that wraps up exactly what we've been talking about. In other words, if in the future, which is what we're looking at down here, that's the future spot exchange rate. If it stays at $1.70, well, then I break even. It doesn't matter if I hedge my position or not. If it goes up to $1.80, I'm actually paying $1.170 instead of $1.80. So this is my savings. $10,000, and I'm so happy. But on the other hand, if the exchange rate drops, think of, you can think of this as the additional cost that wasn't absolutely necessary. And so that's coming out of my pocket. In other words, I'm paying $1.70 when I could have paid $1.60. But you know, it's like insurance. When you pay for insurance, I mean, let's say you, you pay for auto insurance for a year and you ended up not getting into an accident. Are you sorry that you had the insurance policy all that time? No, because while you never needed the insurance, you knew that it was there if it was necessary. And so you paid for peace of mind with that insurance contract. And so it's not worthless, but yes, you know, you never needed the contract, but you knew it was there if it, if it was necessary. All right, so in other words, the decision is to hedge or not to hedge depends on your outlook on the future and how much risk you're willing to tolerate. All right, now. So yeah, just to summarize, to hedge the risk of buying an asset in the future, you would enter into a long forward contract in which you agree to buy pounds in the future for price settled on today. If on the other hand, you're an exporter who would like to sell pounds in the future, you'll enter into a contract to do exactly that, to sell pounds for fixed exchange rate. So the buyer wants to enter into a long contract, the seller, a short contract. All right, so in a nutshell, that's what forward contracts are all about. Okay, and so again, don't forget, we're gonna do more of this in the, in the next couple of weeks, but uh, I think here we have a fairly decent overview of how forward contracts work. And so, you know, we can see more details uh, in the next few classes, but in the meantime, let's dive ahead to a very similar type of derivative called a futures contract. Now, this one, unlike the forward contract, is actually bought through an exchange. So if I want a futures contract, I can go to my Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And in fact, you probably noticed before, these are Japanese yen futures. These are futures contracts. They're very similar to forward contracts, but there's several very important differences as well. Okay, so here, I can um, enter into a futures contract. Oh, look at this, they have options over here. Uh-huh. Man, there's quite a few of them, aren't there? Uh, we'll get back to this, don't worry. But anyway, all right, so how is a futures contract different than a forward contract? Well, in a lot of ways, they're very much the same thing. It's the same logic. Let's put it that way. 
but there are some important institutional differences. Like what? All right, well, first of all, as we've already seen, a forward contract is negotiated between counterparties. A futures contract is traded on an organized exchange like the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. That's the per first difference. Where do you buy it? Okay, now, what else is different? I think I mentioned this earlier, since you're entering into a forward contract with a counterparty, you're always exposed to some kind of credit risk. It doesn't matter who it is. Even if you enter into this contract with Citibank or Chase Manhattan or Chase, Chase JP Morgan Chase, um, Goldman Sachs, you know, Morgan Stanley, there's always a possibility that they'll go out of business. And that would leave you holding the bag. It may not be a big probability of this happening, but it's always possible. It's like Lehman Brothers, which went out of business during the credit crisis in 2008. It was one of the most respected um, investment banks on Wall Street, and yet they went out of business. And so if you had a contract with Lehman Brothers, you were out of luck. There's nobody there to take your side of the position. The futures contracts are guaranteed by the exchanges. So in other words, you cannot have a default with a futures contract because the exchange will cover any potential losses that occur. By the way, what's interesting about this is there's always gotta be a buyer and a seller for any contract and the futures contracts are no different. So what's actually happening here is that when you go to an exchange, they're not taking the opposite position from your contract what they are doing behind the scenes is matching you up with somebody else. Like if I'm buying, they match you up with a seller who you never find out about. It's completely anonymous. And you and this mysterious seller are the ones who are actually in this contract with each other. But if the mysterious seller defaults by not providing whatever they're supposed to do, the exchange will step in and make all the necessary payments. You have no credit risk whatsoever with a futures contract because of the fact that it's traded on an exchange. All right. What about three? Now, here's where it gets interesting. One of the advantages of having these standardized futures contracts is that it's easy to unwind them or get out of them. I'll show an example in a second. With a forward contract, you pretty much locked in your position. You could theoretically negotiate with the counterparty to get out of it, but it's not easy. Here, it's simple to unwind your position. What you're basically doing is if you have a long position, you take a short position. And if you have a short position, you take a long position. All right, so now how would that work? All right, suppose somebody goes to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and they discover that there's a gold contract available for December delivery where the underlying asset is 100 ounces of gold. Okay, so the contract gives you the right, well, actually the obligation to buy 100 ounces of gold in December. What if December rolls around and it turns out you don't need the gold? Well, you do have a legally binding obligation to buy the gold, but what you can do is enter into a contract to sell gold, 100 ounces of gold in December. And so what that means is that the two contracts cash flows exactly offset each other. So even though the contracts are both still active, your net position is now zero. Okay, in other words, no matter what happens to the price of gold, your long position and your short position will exactly offset each other. It's almost like borrowing $100 from one person and then lending it back to them. Or, you know, it's kind of the same idea. Um, your position is now completely zero because you are collecting the same amount that you're paying out no matter what. And so it's easy. And so as a matter of fact, because of this feature, most hedgers with futures contracts 
do not actually take possession of the underlying asset. Usually what they do is they cover their position and at some point they unwind it and they collect their profits if there are any or else they pay their losses to the counterparty. Okay, so for this reason, you rarely see actual delivery of futures contracts. On the other hand, with forward contracts, you almost always see delivery of the asset because it's so hard to get out of it. Now, in fact, if you want to check some, some of this out, let's go back to CME for a second. See if we can find some quotes. Here's British pounds. Oh, where are they? I was hoping to see some quotes. Oh, oh here they are, here they are. All right, so here's one. Here's a December 2021 20 contract. And the, the price is 1.3661. This is the price you can lock in, by the way. Now, it doesn't tell us, I was hoping you can get more information out of this. Those are just the prices. The volume is 216. Oh, uh, let's see. Let's look for um, specs. There we go. This is what a British pound futures contract looks like. First of all, you might notice here, look at this. In order to buy a futures contract, you have to take on a contract which is written on 62,500 British pounds. You can't buy less. You can get more, but it would have to be a multiple of 62,500. That's not very flexible. What if you only need to cover the risk of 32,000 pounds or 58,000? It, it doesn't matter. You've got to pick 62,500 or nothing. All right. Now, here they're giving you the details about uh, when it trades. Um, the price will only change if the, pound, the dollar pound exchange rate changes by more than 0. 0.0001 per pound, one hundredth of a cent. Uh, let's see. The contracts themselves are written for delivery in either March, June, September, or December. That's all they have. If you need delivery in August, well, you got to choose between June and September. Okay, so you see what I mean about the flexibility. There isn't any. You have to take what they have. If this works for you, that's great. Otherwise, you should get into a forward contract. Um, now, here there's a discussion about delivery. Sometimes with these contracts, there's no intention of you taking the asset. You may end up with cash instead. In particular, interest rate futures, there's nothing to deliver. So if you get yourself involved with the, an interest rate futures contract, it will be settled in cash. Because like I said, there's nothing to deliver. But here, the pound is obviously a physical commodity. So if you do take delivery, you will expect to receive uh, um, 62,500 pounds. Okay, so the same thing is true for physical commodities like gold and silver. You're actually expected to take delivery of them um, and then there's all kinds of other good stuff here, but you can see what I meant before by how inflexible these securities really are. So, you know, you want to think twice about using these, but if this is what you want, then here they are. All right. And finally, now this is where it really gets interesting. With the forward contract, you just sign a contract. And on the delivery date, you pay for your asset. Like in the case of the British pound, you pay for your pounds and you're done. A futures contract is very different in this respect. Potentially, you might find yourself having to make or receive cash flows every single day. Why? Because you have to put funds into what's called a margin account. The margin account acts as collateral. Oh, I see there's a chat here. 
Our futures contracts always backed by underlying asset. Yes, there has to be something to deliver, even if it's not like even if it's not a security, like interest rates, for example. There, otherwise, there'd be no way of judging what their value is. So um, the the futures contracts are always based on some specific security or asset, as the case may be. All right. Anyway. So in, with a futures contract, you have to put money into what's called a margin account. And the margin account is simply a form of collateral. Okay, now here's why. Because the exchange is responsible for your losses. They don't want your losses to ever get beyond, let's say a full day's worth of trading. So you must put money into this account to start. And if your uh, account loses money, you'll, you might have to put more money into this account. So the way it's set up is you have what's called initial margin. And it actually, it should have said that. Well, let's go back here for a second. The CME, it's probably here somewhere, the amount of margin you have to put up. I didn't notice it before. I'm surprised it doesn't say it right here. But there, oh, here it is. So 2150. All right, so in other words, to enter into this contract, you have to put into your margin account $2,150. If the value goes down, you might be asked to put some more in there. Actually, no, that's very strange. This is the maintenance margin. This is the minimum amount that you can keep in your account. Uh, the initial margin is probably higher than that. Well, I'm surprised that it's not listed here. Let's say the initial margin is $3,000. That means you have to start with 3,000. And if your position falls below 2150, that means you have to put up more money. Huh. Oh, and here's all the other ones they have. Look, uh, it's more than I realized. And, you know, funnily enough, um, Bitcoin is now available in a futures contract. Let's see, it's in here somewhere. You can actually buy a futures contract on Bitcoin. Although I'm not, maybe not on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Oh, I wonder why. But some of them do have it. They do have Bitcoin futures. Um, as far as the, you know, they're concerned, the Bitcoin is just like any other foreign currency. All right. Um, so let's say here, let, and I made up these numbers. The initial margin is 5,500. The maintenance margin is 5,000. So you start with the 5,500. Now a single, it doesn't, I didn't show it to you, but a single contract on gold is written on hundred ounces. So therefore every $1 increase in the price of gold adds 500, sorry, $100 to the value of your position. A $1 decrease of course does the opposite. What happens if your position loses more than $5,000 so that your balance is less than 5,000? Well, like here, if the gold price goes down $10, you're gonna lose $1,000. Remember, it's 100 to one. And the balance in your account will drop to 4,500. So you have to put money back in, but here's the interesting part. You're not bringing it back up to the maintenance margin, but you have to bring it all the way back to the initial margin, $5,500. So in this case, they're gonna call you up and say, listen, you've got to deposit another thousand dollars. Otherwise we're gonna close out your account. So you have to do it. And <laughs> so therefore you have to be ready for this when you own a futures contract every day, you might find yourself in this position, which is known as a margin call. Wow, that's scary. This is where, I mean, the two are another big difference because with the forward contract, you're never, there's no such thing as a margin call. 
But here, they're pretty serious about this because if you are losing money, they don't want to have to cover it. So if you can't cover your margin call, then they'll just close out your account. And at the very least, they've limited your losses to a single trading day, even if they have to cover it. Now, by the way, this is what brought down Nick Leeson at bearings um, because of the fact that a lot of his positions were futures contracts and they were losing money hand over fist. And so that meant he needed to cover all these margins. So as if it weren't enough that he was losing money, he had to cover a lot of it in the short term very quickly. And in fact, he often wrote um, letters to London asking them for more money. And he would pretend that it was for some other reason and they usually gave it to him, not understanding what, what the problem was because they had no idea that he was a crook, um, that he was lying to them. And eventually he lost it all, of course. He couldn't keep up with the margins payments. So anyway, this process, you may have heard this term, um, is called marking to market, meaning every day the value of your position is updated to the new market prices. And that's one of the huge differences between futures contracts and the other derivatives. The others don't have this. This is unique to the futures markets. All right. So we still have to look at swaps and options. Now, I'll tell you what, this is a very long class, three hours. So there's no way we want to go through this in three straight hours. We have to have a break. I think you'll agree. So I usually try to have it right around 7.30, but I'll tell you what, because we're starting a new topic, why don't we stop it right here? Uh, for, let's say 15 minutes, long enough to get some refreshments. And when we get back, we'll dive into swaps, and then we'll wrap it up with our discussion about options. Now, our discussions will be you know, fairly quick, because we're going to get more into more detail in these securities in later chapters. But at least by the time tonight is over, you'll have a better feel for what these securities are all about. And so that's really what tonight is all about, just getting a nice overview of these different securities. All right, so let's knock it off for about 15 minutes. When we get back, we'll go through swaps, which are fairly straightforward. It's the options that are really complicated. So. Okay, so I'll see you all in a few minutes.
Uh, okay. All right, so I think we're ready for swaps now. All right, now swaps are actually the newest in this group. They've only been around since 1981. It's interesting because it came about um, in a very strange way. Let me see if I can get the details. <clears throat> so here we go. Now this is Investopedia. This is a really excellent source of financial information if you need it. And so the first swap, well, all right, the first swap as we know them today, IBM and the World Bank entered into the first formalized swap agreement in 1981 when the World Bank needed to borrow German marks and Swiss francs to borrow its operations but the governments of those countries prohibited it from borrowing. Well, I can't imagine why that would be. The World Bank's purpose is to um, provide aid to third world countries. Um, and so can you imagine them being told, no, you can't borrow marks and francs. So what IBM did was they borrowed, um, I think dollars and they swapped them. Oh no, no, sorry. IBM borrowed German marks and Swiss francs, which it didn't need and it traded them to the World Bank for dollars. That's what it was. So in other words, because IBM could borrow any currency it wanted to, but the World Bank for whatever reason um, couldn't borrow German marks and Swiss francs, they basically agreed to borrow the other one's currency and then make the trade. So IBM borrowed the marks and Swiss francs and traded them to the World Bank in exchange for dollars. So that became the first swap. Now, Ever since then, when people saw what happened, they began to realize this is a very promising idea. It works well for situations where we have a series of continuing exposures that have to be hedged. <clears throat> like for example, with the uh, foreign exchange example that we did, what if we need to buy British pounds every six months? It's a regular thing because we do business overseas and it's a recurring commitment then you might think about using a swap instead of a single forward contract. Because ultimately a swap is really only a series, or you can think of it as a portfolio of forward agreements or forward contracts. What is different is that the um, trades repeat themselves throughout the lifetime of the swap. Okay, so in, in a way it's really nothing but a more extended version of a forward contract. Now, as as is happening with all the derivatives markets. Originally, the swaps were primarily based on interest rates and currencies, but in the meantime, they've been expanded to so many different areas. So you can trade currencies, you can trade interest rates, exchange rates, uh, equities, commodities, you name it. It can be traded through a swap. They're all out there, but still, even at this point in time, interest rate swaps and exchange rate swaps were currency swaps, as they're called, are by far the most common. Okay, the, the others are important too, but these two are account for most of the trading volume. Now, by the way, before we go any further, I just want to mention swaps like forward contracts are traded in the over-the-counter market. These are not sold through exchanges. And that's because they need to be customized to the needs of the two counterparties. So it wouldn't really make sense to have standardized swaps. Um, it, it's more likely that each one has to be customized to that particular situation. So that's why swaps are normally only traded through um, the over-the-counter market. It's not likely that more than one set of counterparties will need the exact same swap. So that's how it's done. So if I want a swap, I probably have to call up an investment bank to make one or get one in motion. All right, so here's what an interest rate swap looks like. Now, before we go any further, I just want to identify these two key terms. A fixed rate of interest, of course, means one that never changes. And a floating rate of interest means that it can change periodically. Now, the classic example of this is the adjustable rate mortgage, which you may have heard about. Most of the time with mortgages, the rate of interest is fixed in advance, and that's a fixed rate mortgage, of course. But for certain mortgages, 
the rate can actually be updated every single year. And so those are known as flow, um, adjustable mortgages or adjustable rate mortgages. And the rate itself is said to be floating because it can change every year. So there exist bonds in the marketplace where you can actually get a floating rate of interest, which means that the interest rate in your bond is going to change every year. Now, they're fairly unusual compared to fixed rate bonds. Most bonds are actually fixed rate bonds. So the purpose of a swap is to do this. If you own a fixed rate bond and you prefer to have a floating rate bond, the interest rate swap lets you trade the cash flows between the two bonds. Okay, so in other words, um, let's see. Let's see what example we have here to make it more clear. Let me just throw this in here real fast. Um, suppose that a corporation or a bank, let's say, owns a fixed rate bond and um, a, an insurance company owns a floating rate bond. It's in their investment portfolio. The bank would prefer to have a floating rate bond and the insurance company would prefer to have a fixed rate bond. Rather than sell these bonds, the, the bank and insurance company can exchange the coupon, the interest payments with each other. All right, so in other words, every time the bank gets a fixed rate co uh, coupon, as it's called, or interest payment, they trade it or they deliver it to the insurance company in exchange for the floating rate payment that they receive from their bond. Um, so now in practice, um, they don't actually trade the, uh, the interest payments. They actually trade the difference between them. And because the insurance company has a floating rate bond, sometimes the float insurance company will have to pay money to the bank and sometimes the bank will have to pay money to the insurance company. So let me just add that to my example. Um, suppose, let's just put some hard numbers on this. Suppose that the two bonds are worth, or each worth a million dollars. The fixed rate bond pays 5% per year in interest. The following shows the floating rate payments over the next five years. Okay, so you got the two bonds. The bank owns the fixed rate bond. And so what's going to happen is Uh, let's make a table out of this. Let's make a, a normal table out of this. All right, so the bank interest rate and it'll be five all the way down. Hold on a second, I have to change something. This will be the year. Okay, so we got five years, All right? So this will be 5%. And let's say the insurance company's floating rate bond
is here. And I'm just gonna make some numbers up. Let's just say in year one, it's 3% and then six, five, four, and then seven. Okay. So what's going to happen? Now remember, what's happening is that the bank has exchange, agreed to exchange its fixed rate payments for the floating rate payments of the insurance company. So let's try to figure out what happens here. Okay, so remember the, and once again, let's remind ourselves, the bank pays fixed, a fixed rate, the insurance company pays a floating rate. Okay, because the bank owns the fixed rate bond, they'll trade their interest payments to the insurance company in exchange for a floating rate. So what that means is that in the first year, the bank pays 2% to the insurance company. Why? Because their fixed rate is 5%. The floating rate is only 3%. So the bank pays the difference of 2%. The next year though, the insurance company pays the bank 1% because the floating rate is higher than the fixed rate. In the third year, there's no payment because the rates are equal. In the fourth year, the bank pays 1%. And in the last year, the insurance company pays 2%. So the net effect of all of this is that the bank is earning the floating rate of interest and the insurance company is earning the fixed rate of interest because they've traded their cash flows. So the bank will earn the floating rate of interest over the next five years while the insurance company will earn the um, fixed rate because they are trading the cash flows or the interest payments, I should say, from these bonds without having to sell them. So that would be an example of a floating interest rate uh, swap. You're trading the coupons or interest payments from one bond for the other. And so what it does is it changes your inflows from let's say the fixed rate to the floating rate or vice versa. Okay, so now why would they do this? Well, the bank is of the opinion that rates will head up in the future. Therefore, if they're right, they'll get more back from the insurance company than they pay to the insurance company. The insurance company may have the opposite outlook. They may think that rates are heading down and they'll be able to trade lower and lower payments to the bank in exchange for 5%. So uh, let me add that in here too. The bank, by entering into the swap, the bank hopes that rates will rise in the future, the insurance company hopes that rates will fall in the future. And if so, and they're right, whoever's right will make money, more money than if they'd held on to their own bond. So basically they're gambling that they're right about the future direction of interest rates. Okay, so that would be one motivation for entering into an interest rate swap trading your, um, your cash flows for a different type of cash flow. Okay, 
So, um, by the way, if you notice too, um, the actual dollar amount would be two, that, that percentage multiplied by a million dollars, okay? Because the bonds are worth a million dollars. This payment here, this 2% is actually um, 200, no, $20,000 because that's based on a million. So the interest payments are here, but the actual dollar amounts would require us to multiply those interest, um, interest payments by the, what we call the notional principle of a million dollars. So that's how much cash is actually going back and forth because the bonds are worth a million dollars. Okay, so therefore, in the first year, the bank is paying 20,000. The next year, the insurance company pays 10,000. The third year, there's no payment. The fourth year, the bank is paying 10,000 to the insurance company. And in the last year, the insurance company pays 20,000 back to the bank. Uh -huh. And of course, they continue to collect the, the payments from their own bonds. So what they've done again, the whole idea here is that the bank is collecting the floating rate interest rate and the insurance company collects the fixed rate. All right, now with a structure like this, traditionally the floating rate of interest was tied to something called LIBOR. Now LIBOR is in the process of being phased out, but for many years, in fact, for decades, this was the standard floating rate of interest used in these types of contracts. The LIBOR rate is the rate of interest. By the way, LIBOR stands for London Interbank Offer Rate. It was the rate of interest at which these large British banks in London would borrow and lend among themselves. So Barclays needed a quick overnight loan of 100 million pounds they could go to um, Royal Bank of Scotland and obtain a loan, and the rate of interest would be LIBOR. And this market was massive, and I mean massive. What happened? Well, unfortunately, and this is so sad, it so often happens, there was a series of scandals, in particular at Barclays Bank, the traders were manipulating the LIBOR rate in order to make illegal profits. So the whole thing was such a mess that rather than trying to reform this system, instead it was decided that LIBOR will disappear and it will be replaced by rates in each of the different countries, like the US and England and France and Germany, in the United States, the Fed came up with this rate called SOFR, the Secured Overnight Financing Rate, which will soon be used instead of LIBOR in any contracts which involved um, floating rates of interest. And so LIBOR will be disappearing in favor of SOFR. Now, what does it actually mean? Uh, let's go double check that real fast. The exact definition, yeah, there it is. Lund LIBOR transitions to SOFR. It is a security overnight backward looking risk-free rate based on actual borrowing collateralized by treasuries, which have been established as an alternative to LIBOR. In other words, um, imagine the following scenario. Oh, no, here it is. It looks like I've already got an example. It's a type of repo. What's happening is it's an arrangement in which low cost collateralized loans are made between banks. So let's say Bank A has a treasury bill in its portfolio worth a million dollars. It needs to raise cash in a hurry without selling the T-bill. They go to B. B says, all right, here's what we'll do for you. We'll buy the bill from you for a million dollars. And then, Ah, uh, this is a mistake right here. This should be A. They're going to buy the bill for a million dollars and then sell it back to A the next day.
and Bank A will pay them not a million dollars, but a million dollars and five hundred, a million and five hundred dollars. In other words, A is basically borrowing a million dollars by selling their treasury to Bank B and agreeing to buy it back the next day for a slightly higher price. That's the key to the whole thing. So A needs the money in a hurry, but they only need it for one night. So they sell their security to B with the understanding that B will sell it back to them for a slightly higher price. The difference is the interest cost. So Bank A has paid $500 for an overnight loan of a million dollars. So that rate, by the way, the reason why this is considered to be risk-free is because if A can't pay the million and five hundred dollars, Bank B will just sell the treasury bill. Ooh, all right. Well, there you go. So it's completely risk-free for Bank B, who is actually the lender. And so this is known as a repo or repurchase agreement. And the SOFR rate is the rate that was charged. So in other words, $500 out of a million is, um, Point oh five percent, one twentieth of a percent. That would be then considered to be the SOFA rate because it's a secured overnight financing loan. And, um, or so, uh, secured overnight financing rate. That's how much was charged for this repo. It's not much. It's always been a very tiny amount and it's because it's typically for one night or maybe a few days and it is collateralized. So therefore there's no risk. And so the SOFA is going to be replacing LIBOR. Now, the only unfortunate thing about this is that the LIBORs had maturities going out a full year. The SOFA is an overnight rate. So it'll be interesting to see how that works out in this market. But because this rate can't be manipulated by traders, it's much safer to use it than LIBOR. And if you want to read up about this, you know, there's plenty of articles on the internet about how LIBOR um, had to be replaced and why and the scandals. And, um, but, you know, it got to the point where everyone said, you know, we, we can't use this rate anymore because we never know if other people are manipulating it. All right, but let's, okay, so let's get, go over that uh, later. Uh, let's just now look at this example of a swap, an interest rate swap. A corporation issues $100 million worth of debt for the following terms and conditions. It's a five-year bond that they're issuing. The coupon is LIBOR plus two, so it's a floating rate bond. That means that the rate will literally be whatever LIBOR is plus another 2%. Now that of course exposes them to the risk that LIBOR will go up in the future, but they seem to be convinced that it's only gonna go down. All right, so the bonds are out there and let's just say all of a sudden their chief economist says, you know, I'm pretty sure that rates are going up. Maybe we shouldn't have done this. So what they can do now is rather, they can't do anything about the bonds. They've already sold them. They're obligated to paying LIBOR plus 2%. What they can do is convert this floating rate liability into a fixed rate liability by finding a, a partner to trade with. What we need to do is go to a swap dealer and what we're going to do and we'll, we're, there's going to be a diagram, by the way, to explain this better. We're going to pay a fixed rate of interest to the swap dealer, and they will pay us back a floating rate, which we will then use to pay the bondholders. And the effect of this is that we'll end up being exposed only, we'll, we'll only have to pay a fixed rate of interest. All right, so let's look at some numbers. We enter into a swap where we're paying 6% to a dealer in exchange for LIBOR for each of the five years in this bond based on a notional principle or amount of $100 million. So where does this get us? 
Why are we doing this? Well, let's find out. Uh, let, let me jump ahead and show you the diagram. So remember, we owe, down here are the bondholders. They're, they've been promised LIBOR plus 2%. We have to pay it no matter what. So we approach the dealer and the dealer says, listen, we'll give you LIBOR, but you'll give us back 6%. So what's happening is that the LIBOR that we're getting from the dealer can be passed along to the bondholders. So the total cost to us now is this six plus this two. So the corporation now pays eight percent instead of LIBOR plus two percent. And so they've eliminated their exposure to floating rates of interest. No matter where rates go now, the corporation will pay 8% and that's it. So their risk is gone. That's what this is all about. Trading one exposure for another, okay? And they're happy. Now, if LIBOR drops, well, then they may say, well, maybe this wasn't such a good idea, but for sure, they have reduced or eliminated their interest rate risk. Okay. And by the way, this is, I, I think I forgot to mention this. This type of arrangement is called a fixed for floating rate swap because your one party is paying a fixed rate and the other party is paying a floating rate. This is the most standard type of interest rate swap. There are others, of course, but this is the most common type, fixed for floating. You can also find swaps that are floating for floating, where you're trading two different floating rates. There's all kinds of possibilities. The sky is the limit, but this is the most standard type. All right, now here's another example where we have the opposite situation. We've got a pension fund that's receiving interest payments. All right, and so what's going on there? A pension fund owns a floating rate bond. The notional principal is a million dollars. It matures in two years and it collects a coupon of LIBOR plus 3%. The problem from their perspective is that they expect rates to fall. That's not good because that means their coupon or interest payment will fall. So how do they get around this problem without actually selling the bond? Well, it'll approach a dealer and offer to pay a floating rate to the dealer in exchange for a fixed rate. So let's take a look at a diagram to see how this would work out. So they're gonna pay floating, but they're gonna get fixed. Okay, so here we go. Ah, here we go. Now remember, they own this bond. So they're collecting LIBOR plus three. You're going to now turn around and deliver this LIBOR to the dealer in exchange for 7%. So their net revenues go from LIBOR plus three to 10%. And remember, that's based on the notional principle of $100 million. So they're getting a million dollars a year instead of taking their chances on LIBOR. And so that makes the pension fund very happy. They've eliminated all of their interest rate risk, which of course is the risk that LIBOR falls. All right, so you can see these are two opposite cases, but both of them can be um, handled with an interest rate swap. 
Okay, so, um, and again, like I said, there's many different kinds of interest rate swaps, but this is the most standard type. Now, the other base popular type is the currency swap. Whereas the name suggests, we're trading currencies. One thing I, oh, one thing I forgot to mention here, um, in a situation like this, um, I'll add this at the end here. Note, okay, this is an important detail. With an interest rate swap, the notional principle is not exchanged, okay? Only the interest payments. All right, so in other words, you're, then I mentioned with this last bond, it was worth $100 million. They're not trading the $100 million with each other. They're only trading the interest payments. The reason why I mention that now is because that will not be true with the currency swaps. With the currency swap, the notional principle is exchanged because it is denominated in two different currencies. So basically a typical interest rate or currency swap means you're trading cash flows with fixed rates of interest, but denominated in two different currencies. So you might be trading, for example, US LIBOR for British pound LIBOR. So you're looking at two different currencies and um, two different Oh yeah, well, sorry, I said the wrong thing because you, you might get a swap with LIBOR, but typically they're fixed rates. So yes, it's possible to trade US dollar LIBOR for British pound LIBOR, but more likely you'll trade some fixed interest rate in dollars for a fixed interest rate in pounds. That's the most common type. The others exist too, but that's the most common type. Now let's look at an example. It's always easier with an example. A U.S. corporation wants to invest in a 100,000 pound bond that has a 6% coupon or interest rate that was issued by a U.K. corporation. Now here's the rub. If I buy a foreign bond and the dollar gets stronger, I'm gonna actually lose money. Now let's do a little detour here to explain why this is happening. Um, for example, suppose that the corporation owns a British pound bond that pays, uh, let's say, 100,000 pounds in interest every year. Okay, if the exchange rate between the dollar and the pound is let's say $1.50 per pound, then the interest payment will be worth, and then you would multiply them together. 100,000 pounds would be multiplied by a dollar fifty. And you would end up with one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Fine. But what happens if the dollar gets stronger? Now, we talked about this earlier. In order, what that means, whoops. That would imply that it takes fewer dollars to buy a pound. So if the dollar appreciates, from a dollar fifty per pound to a dollar forty a pound, then the one hundred thousand pounds 
in interest would only be worth, and then you would multiply them out, $1.40 per pound is multiplied by 100,000 pounds. Whoops. Okay, hold on. Uh, which equals $140,000. Okay, so in other words, the value of a foreign investment declines when the dollar appreciates. Now, of course, if the dollar depreciates, the opposite would happen, and you'd be pretty happy about that. But, you know, we may not want to take any chances. So what happens? The company, US company, wants to buy that British bond, but they're worried about the exchange rate risk. So what do they do? If they buy this bond, they're going to get a coupon every year worth 6,000 pounds. Okay, so if let's say the current exchange rate is $1.90 a pound, that translates into $11,400 per year. If the dollar suddenly jumps down to a stronger level of $1.80, that drops us down to $10,800. Ooh, that hurts. So here's what we're gonna do. We'll enter into a currency swap where we buy the, the British pound bond, and then we enter into a swap in which we pay the pound rate and receive the dollar rate. All right, now that's, again, I think we'll be better off when we see the actual diagram. This is very complicated. So we'll start by saying the corporation buys the British pound bond, they approach a dealer and say, listen, will pay a fixed rate of 6% in pounds in exchange for 5% in dollars. The spot exchange rate is $1.90. Now, in this case, as I said before, we also have to trade not just the interest payments, but we're also trading the notional principle. So that means when the exchange rate is $1.90, in order to buy a 100,000 pound bond, we're gonna to have to pay $190,000, okay? We use $190,000 to pay for 100,000 pounds, and then we buy the bond. So we're out $190,000. And the uh, interest payments will be based on these notional principles. 100,000 for the British bond, 190 um, for the American bond. So we're going to pay 6% to the dealer in pounds. Okay, in other words, we bought, remember we bought the British pound bond, the coupon that we're entitled to of 6,000 pounds a year will pay to the dealer. The dealer is paying us back 5% of 190,000, which means they owe us $190,000. All right, so the way this works now, the, the, the diagram is missing. It's not as useful in this case. Just keep in mind that initially, let me have this in here. Initially, the corporation, or the firm, pays 190,000. For a 100,000 pound bond. Okay. And so basically, well, actually I shouldn't write it this way. Um, hold on a second. We swap with the dealer. Let's, let's, let's make that a little clearer to the dealer. For 100,000 pounds, which are used to buy the British pound bond. So 
So down here, you can see the UK bond is paying us 6% a year, but that's in pounds. So I'm actually getting 6,000 pounds a year. I don't want 6,000 pounds. I want dollars. So the British um, pound rate, I'm paying 6,000 pounds of the dealer. The dealer is giving me 5% of this number, which means $9,500 cash US every time an interest payment is made. In addition to this part, of course. Now, by the way, this implies that at the end of the swap, the firm will pay 100,000 pounds for 190,000. So there's, they have to reverse the initial transaction. We initially paid the dealer $190,000 in exchange for 100,000 pounds. At the end, when the swap is done, we'll reverse that transaction. We have to give the pounds back to the dealer in exchange for our $190,000. So in the meantime though, every interest payment, we're trading ours to the dealer in exchange for $9,500 in cash. So what that means then is that um, we are able to, in spite of the fact that we own a British pound bond, we're earning dollars from that investment because we're trading our pounds for, for dollars. Okay, so that avoids the risk that the dollar will appreciate, reducing the value of our payments. So in other words, if the corporation suddenly says to itself, hey, wait a minute, we think the pound is going to get stronger, uh, a weaker rather, that means we better do this because it'll help reduce the risk that we'll lose money. All right, now, um, now here's an interesting twist on this. Let me just show you the diagram. What can happen sometimes is that corporations in one country may decide to borrow in a foreign country to save interest. Let's look at an example where that happens. So the US corporation, let's say it's possible for us to borrow at one and a half percent in the US and half a percent in Japan. We're a multinational. We have branches in both Tokyo and New York and we can borrow in either market. We'd like to borrow at a lower cost. So we issue bonds denominated in yen and then we trade the yen payments for dollars, okay? So how would that work? Well, let's just say that we issue a million dollars worth of five-year uh, bonds, but in yen. The current exchange rate is 100 yen per dollar. So the bond that we're issuing is actually worth 100 million yen. But the Japanese rate of interest is only half a percent. So half a percent of 100 million is 5 million yen. Now, in the meantime, uh, actually, no, that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to keep this down to minimum. Now, here's the thing, though. We want to get rid of the foreign exchange risk. So what we're going to do is we're going to pay dollars. Uh, by the way, the corporation, US corporation, will pay these 5 million yen every year. So we don't want to have to take a chance on buying expensive yen. So what we'll do instead is we will enter into a, a swap in which we receive the 5 million yen in exchange for dollars. What that means then is that we will be paying our debts in dollars and thereby eliminating our foreign exchange risk. So let's just take a look at the diagrams. You can see what's going on here. So we borrowed 
in Japan for half a percent. And so what we're going to do is we approach a dealer who's going to pay us half a percent in yen again from the dealer. So that exactly offsets the amount we have to pay to the bondholders. Ah, then we pay 1% to the dealer. So our interest costs are locked in at 1% in dollars, which, well, if this was done properly, the point of doing this is that we, in this example, we were assuming that in order to borrow in the United States, it's gonna cost us one and a half percent. So by entering into the swap after uh, borrowing in Japan, we've lowered our interest costs by half a percent. So this is lower than borrowing at 1.5% in the US. So we save money and we've gotten rid of our foreign exchange risk. So that's a pretty sweet setup. In fact, this is one of the reasons, another reason why investors like swaps so much. You can make transactions in a foreign currency and possibly save interest or earn more interest and yet get rid of your foreign exchange risk. So that's kind of a nice setup. All right, so now we're gonna save the best for last in my opinion, options. Now options are very complicated. In fact, so much so that um, we're gonna need to spend at least three weeks with them. But here, I just wanna give you the briefest possible overview uh, and this is very brief because like I said, this is a very complicated market. Options are the most powerful of all the derivatives. They give us the most flexibility. But here's the interesting part. A forward contract is an agreement. There's no actual cost associated with it. A swap is the same. A futures contract, while you have to put up collateral in your margin account, that's still your money, okay? An option is the only derivative where you actually have to pay for it. There's an actual price associated with it. In fact, if you wanna see some option quotes, let me just briefly show you where to find them. And maybe we can have some fun looking at them for a minute. Let's go to finance.yahoo.com, which is a great place to get data. Let's ask for Apple. We enter the ticker symbol for Apple and down here it says, oh, options. These are all the options that are currently trading on Apple stock. Now, this is very complicated. We'll learn how to read this table as we go along, but let me just pick one at random. Let's say this one right here. This option, oh boy, I don't know what just happened. This is referred to as a call option. And there's a bunch of them to choose from. This number right here, the strike price means I'm buying the right to buy a share of Apple stock for $150. The option will cost me $1.02. So there's the price. It'll cost me a dollar and two to buy the right to buy the Apple stock for 150. So it sounds very complicated, doesn't it? I'm paying for the right to do something. But the beauty of this setup is that unlike the other contracts we looked at, in this case, I can change my mind. I'm under no legal obligation to buy the Apple stock if I change my mind. So when you buy an option, what you're paying for is that ability to change your mind. That's where most of the value comes from. The fact that you're not required to do this, but you can if you want to. And so, in fact, the name option is, comes from the fact that any transactions you might agree to are always optional. Okay. 
So the option is a derivative that gives you the right, but never the obligation to either buy or sell an asset in the future. This part is the same though. The price at which you can do this is locked in today. Just like the forward contracts and the futures and the swaps, I can lock in the price now at which I can make a transaction in the future, but it's always optional. So the only thing is then I have to pay for that privilege. And these can get very, very expensive, but they're also much more powerful and flexible than all the other derivatives, which accounts for their uh, popularity. The volume of trading in options is absolutely massive as we saw uh, on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Now, to, in order to identify an option, there's several characteristics that we need to know. First of all, what is it giving us the right to buy or sell? We refer to that as the underlying asset. So in our the example we were just looking at, the Apple stock would be considered to be the underlying asset. Okay, that's where we have the right to buy or sell. Now, Options are available on just about anything you could imagine at this point in time. Um, you can buy, use them to buy. Uh, in, now, it, in the case of interest rates, there's nothing that can actually be delivered. So when you're buying an option on interest rates, you're doing that, or let's just say you'll get, the settlement will be in cash. Whereas if you buy an option on the British pound, and you choose to use your option to buy it, you're actually gonna take delivery of British pounds. So here, this is one of those cases where there's nothing to deliver, so you just get a cash settlement. But for these others, like currencies and equities, indexes are the same way. There's nothing to deliver, so you get a cash payment here. Uh, of course, precious metals. Now here's an interesting twist. You can buy an option where the underlying security is itself a futures contract. So in other words, what you're paying for is the right to enter into that contract with a specific price. Okay, I might, for example, have the right to enter into a futures contract on gold with a price of $1,500 an ounce. So these are often known as futures options. Okay, an option on a futures contract is called a futures option. Um, oh, here it is. And not only that, but you can actually enter into an option to buy or enter into a swap, and they're called swaptions, swap options, or, or swaptions. So in other words, you can combine these different derivatives, especially with options, and create some very complex products, which is kind of interesting. Um, and in fact, I'll tell you what, at this point in time, most of the options that trade in the marketplace are futures options because they have a lot of very convenient properties. And so most of them are actually futures options. Um, and as I mentioned before, you can get an, into an option on a swap. It means you have the right to enter into that swap with a particular fixed rate. And those are called swaptions. And you can probably imagine that you can also enter it into an option on a forward contract, and they're known as forward options. Okay, you have the right to enter into a forward contract, but not the obligation. And believe it or not, as if that wasn't enough, you can enter into an option that gives you the right to buy or sell another option. These are called compound options options on options. So in other words, you can uh, buy an option on another option or sell an option on another option where you have the right to buy or sell at a predetermined price. So these markets can get, as you can see, horribly complicated. Now, the price at which you're allowed to buy or sell is often called the strike or exercise price. And in the example I showed you a minute ago with Apple, we were looking at the one it had a strike price of $150, which means that it gives me the right to buy Apple stock for $150 if I choose to do so. All right, so we have to know that to uniquely characterize an option. 
Also, there's always a specific maturity date. The option doesn't last forever. The date on which it expires is called the maturity date. And so if you look here, in this case, all of these options expire on November 5th. That is our maturity date. Oh, we've already seen this. All right. And then now you have to decide by that date if you want to use your option or not. If you don't, and the, um, the option just expires and it becomes worthless. So you've got up until that date to make a decision. And if you choose not to use it, well, then it just expires. Now, the two basic types of options that you'll run into are the call option. And again, I showed you that here. This is a call. These are all calls. They give you the right to buy and puts give you the right to sell. All right. And so let me just go back and show you where the puts are. They're right down here in the bottom. So there's a bunch of puts as well. These give you the right to sell the stock for this price, the strike price. The ones on top are the calls. They give you the right to buy. All right. Also, there's another way in which they can be classified, European and American. Now, geography has nothing to do with this. The European style options can only be exercised on the expiration date. The American style options, you can exercise any time up until that expiration date. So the American style options are clearly more valuable than the European style. But of course, that means the American style options are going to be more expensive. All right. So many options in the marketplace are either one or the other. For example, interest rate options tend to be European style and stock options tend to be American style. But if you look around enough, you might be able to find them both. Okay, but these are the basic types. Later on in the course, we're gonna see some more complicated versions of these, which are referred to as exotic options because they're so complicated. All right, um, now the premium is the price that you have to pay for the options. So remember, I showed you that in the chart with the Apple stock. If you wanna do this, you have to pay money for that option. If you don't use your option, you just lose the money you pay for it. Okay, that's just the way it is. It's like um, an insurance policy. If you, you keep paying the premiums, if you never use it, you don't get the premiums back. So the premium on an option is the same thing as the price. This is how much you have to pay to buy it. Now, by the way, this is where all the hardcore math gets involved. Most of what we're doing here is not terribly mathematical, but this is. This part is very, very complicated mathematically. And we're gonna look at this uh, later on in the course, but um, this is really the only part that requires a lot of intense math. Luckily, Excel can do a lot of that for us. Now, why is it this the case? Why do we have to pay for these things? Because they have a limited loss potential. This is one of the most interesting things about options. There's a limit to how much you can lose, and we'll discuss this in great detail, but there's no limit to how much you can make. And that's a pretty sweet position to be in. I think you'll agree. Unlimited profit potential combined with limited loss potential, that's why you have to pay for an option. You don't really get that anywhere else. Now, the pricing itself, like I said, this is a very complex topic. We'll be discussing two models, very popular models for pricing options, uh, which you'll see in Hull's book. The, the Black-Scholes model, which is a formula, and the binomial option pricing model, which we'll discuss in a few chapters, is a more complex version of the Black-Scholes model, which makes it easier to price American style options. Um, now, here's an interesting side note. The developers of the Black-Scholes model, 
eventually won the Nobel Prize in economics because the, their model proved to be so important. Without that model, we can't price options and then they're not worth very much to us. In fact, trading and options really only got going after the release of this Black-Scholes model. So it's very important and we're going to study it um, way down towards the end of the course, maybe week six, let's say. But right now we're gonna focus our attention on looking at these different products in more detail. So for example, next week, we'll be focusing on, well, we're gonna come back and revisit forwards and futures and learn them in more detail. In other words, we sort of <laughs> did a nice overview. Oh, there's some math here. Uh, we did a nice overview here, but there's still a lot more details that we want to learn to truly understand how forwards and futures work. Okay, so in other words, uh, we have to start getting involved with some more math and some more applications to truly understand what we're doing tonight. So, uh, and we're also going to be looking at hedging strategies, more sophisticated versions of what we were doing. So that's what we have to look forward to next week. I think it'll be a couple of weeks before we get back to options. Let's see. Swaps. No, next week is week three is swaps. Four, five, and six are options. They do take three weeks. Seven is actually about options too, but it's more about the risk of options. So, all right. So I think I'll tell you what, I know it's our first night. I'm sure we're all weary from all this wonderful discussion about derivatives. Um, it's a bit much on a Monday night, I'm sure, but it's awfully, awfully interesting material. And so don't forget there's an assignment that you're expected to have ready by next Monday. It shouldn't take too long. I mean, it's just exactly what we were doing tonight. Like, let's go get, go get it one more time. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, this is pretty straightforward. There's a simple swap example. Um, there's a forward contract on British pounds, and there's a brief discussion about the differences between forward and futures contracts. So this, this won't take that long. In fact, you may not even bother to open up the Excel because you can do this so quickly and easily. So um, I'll tell you what, why don't you send these back to me next week or by next week, and then we'll carry on next week with a more intense look at forwards and futures and the differences between them. All right, well, I think that's all we have to say for tonight. So if there's no last minute questions, I think we'll call it a night. How does that sound? All right, all right, so I'll see you all next time then. All right. Thank you. Okay.